Hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, our first Managing the Planet of 2020. These events are sponsored by the School of Global Environmental Sustainability at CSU. My name is Peter Bockland. I'm the Associate Director of the school, and I'll be moderating the panel tonight. I'd like to uh, give you a couple ground rules for the discussion, and then we'll, uh, we'll get right into it. Let me first of all, though, make an announcement about another upcoming event. This is our first Managing the Planet of the Year. In a couple weeks, one of our panelists that we have here will actually be presenting one of our Antarctic lectures. That's going, that's on February 25th at the uh, Old Town Library. And the, uh, the topic will be a view from the Arctic Ocean lessons for Antarctica. And it will feature Jesse uh, Cremian, who is one of our panelists here tonight. So that's another event coming up for us. Uh, the topic tonight is ocean science and the sustainable development goals, kind of the, the intersection of what we know about the oceans and, and changing the oceans and how uh, that will affect the sustainability, the UN sustainable development goals, uh, a number of which focus specifically on the oceans. And we're lucky to have a really great panel to address the topic here tonight. Uh, up here on the stage, uh, the first one I'll introduce is Craig Starger. He's an associate of mine at the uh, School of Global Environmental Sustainability where he both uh, teaches some of our courses and then is very active in uh, running a major international sustainability research program called Future Earth. And we're lucky to have Craig with us on that. His background is actually conservation biology and ocean science as well. So he's a perfect person to speak on this topic. Next to Craig is Jesse Premian. Jesse is, uh, my notes. she's a research scientist in the atmospheric sciences department here at, uh, at CSU, and I'll let her, uh, I'll let each panelist actually tell you more about them. But uh, Jesse uh, has studied a lot of different aspects of uh, climate change and, and global change, specifically the aerosol impacts on clouds and precipitation. And she's also been really active in Arctic research, including spending time on an icebreaker uh, drifting in the Arctic sea ice and a very creative experiment that's being sponsored right now and is ongoing. Uh, next, to, next to Jesse is uh, Shane Canados. He's in the Department of Biology, where he does a lot of interesting work on marine mammals and all kinds of other things. And so you'll hear more about him from himself and his actual work that he's doing. And then finally, Rebecca Gruby from our Department of Human Dimensions of Natural Resources, who's doing all kinds of interesting work as well, specifically looking at the role of philanthrop philanthropic sponsorship of research projects and uh, how that uh, compares to more traditional forms of research sponsorship. So we're looking forward to hearing from all of them. I'm gonna give them each a couple minutes to tell you in detail about their work. Then we'll open uh, the floor for questions when you ask a question, wave your hand. I'll come to you with the mic. Uh, please identify yourself. You can feel free to make some kind of a plug if you're working on something exciting or you want to tell us a little bit about an organization that you're in. We would very much like it if you would then ask questions as opposed to making lengthy statements from the floor, although I recognize sometimes people want to you know, engage in the discussion and that's what we're trying to do. But the main purpose here is to query our panelists so let's try and stay focused on questions. And then finally, I'd like to give a special shout out to uh, students and a teacher from Fort Collins High who are here uh, in the middle of the room. And we love, when, uh, we love when anybody from the community comes to these events. One of the things we like best about these is, is the intersection of CSU with the community. But we especially love it when we intersect with the broader educational community here. And we'd love to see the students attending these events and are always very impressed with the insightful questions that they ask. So we're looking forward to that especially. So I'm gonna turn it over to the panelists now to tell you a little bit more about them, and then we'll dive in. Craig? Thanks, thank you, Peter. Thanks everybody for coming. Uh, my name is Craig Starger. I'm a research scientist in the School of Global Environmental Sustainability. And I've been working in ocean sustainability in many different capacities over about 20 years now. Um, I spent most of my graduate school career um, scuba diving all around the world, studying coral reef ecology. Um, 
kind of hardcore field biologist for many years. I then took a complete 180 and moved to Washington, D.C., traded my wetsuit for a business suit, and entered the world of policy and ocean policy and um, international affairs. Um, so Peter and I have a, a history, a shared history in Washington, D.C. together. Um, not at the same time, but similar experiences. Um, and then I spent two years in Bangkok working for the U.S. Agency for International Development on uh, foreign assistance programs for ocean sustainability in Southeast Asia. Um, so I've taken many different approaches over the years, both from field biology to policy to international development. And now um, here at CSU, I'm still doing ocean sustainability as we are from the Rocky Mountains. It's still possible. Uh, you don't have to live near the ocean to do it. Um, and I really like that fact that we're talking tonight about the sustainable development goals, because as many of you may know, um, in 2015, the UN adopted uh, 17, I believe, sustainable development goals. And SDG 14 is the one that deals with oceans. And in, so the, the 17 goals were adopted in 2015. In 2017, about two years later, the UN had the first conference dedicated to just focusing on one of the SDGs, and it was focused on oceans. And that was SDG 14. It was June of 2017. And I had the honor of speaking on behalf of CSU and Future Earth at the UN General Assembly. So um, over the years, I've taken many different approaches to ocean sustainability and um, look forward to your questions. Thanks. Hello. Um, so my name is Jesse, and I am an atmospheric scientist in the Department of Atmospheric Science. Um, so actually, my background is in chemistry. I hail from Illinois. Um, <laughs> um, I did. Uh, I went to grad school in San Diego, which was also a very nice place to live um, in chemistry. But that's where I really got integrated into atmospheric science, and where I really became interested in climate change. And so my research there for my PhD focused on how aerosols, their composition sources, how those can affect things like how clouds form and how precipitation can form. And so a lot of my work was actually done in the Sierra Nevada Mountains in California, looking at aerosols that can come over from Asia and Africa and how that can affect storms in, on the West Coast. Um, after that, I moved to Boulder and did a postdoc fellowship at NOAA. Um, and so I was there for a few years and then became a research scientist. And that's where I really became interested in Arctic research specifically. It's such a really beautiful and unique place um, but it's a very delicate ecosystem and a very delicate climate. So that's what's, what really I've tried to focus on over the last mm, eight years or so. Um, and so a lot of my research focuses specifically on the ocean and the Arctic Ocean and how biology and ecology and the ocean and the sea ice can actually affect climate. Um, so I've done a number of different expeditions on icebreakers up in open water. Um, as Peter alluded to, I just came back from four months from an icebreaker near the North Pole. Um, it's for a year-long transpolar drift experiment. So it's an icebreaker that purposely freezes in the ice to try to understand um, Arctic climate over the course of the entire annual cycle. So if you have time when you go home, look up Mosaic Icebreaker and you'll find out some more information about it. Um, but yeah, I'm happy to be here now back in Colorado where it's um, temperatures above zero, which is great, and it's, there's sunlight. So um, I'm happy to answer any of your questions. Good evening, everybody. I'm Shane Kanatis. I'm a professor in biology here. Uh, I've been here at Colorado for 15 years. If you have not figured out, Brooklyn, New York is the accent. <laughs> uh, I am looking at this from a completely different perspective from most of the panels. I'm the animal guy. So I chase animals around the world to figure out how they adapt to the ecosystem, what they need from their environment, and how we can better conserve the environment for the animals. I just returned from uh, second field season. Third one is coming up in the Mac, opposite season. Going back down to Antarctica, chasing leopard seals. And the overall project is looking how leopard seal can adapt to the changing climate and the loss of ice, and how that's going to affect their life. Hi, my name is Rebecca Gruby, and I'm a social scientist in the Human Dimensions of Natural Resources Department at CSU. 
I grew up in Florida, surfing, loved the ocean, wanted to spend my career saving and being in the ocean, although I find myself in Colorado, a little bit far away from the ocean, but I still think and talk about it all the time. Um, did my PhD at Duke University at the Marine Lab. Um, and you know, Shane says he stalks and follows wildlife around the world. I stalk and follow people and governance. And so um, a lot of my work focuses on oceans governance at the global level, but also at regional, national, and local levels, particularly in the Pacific Islands, so in many different islands across Oceania. Um, I've spent a lot of time thinking and working in global environmental governance. So since 2010, I've been part of um, large research collaborations that attend um, sites of global environmental decision making to understand the processes through which we make the sustainable development goals, for example. So I spent time at the Convention on Biological Diversity, Rio Plus 20, meeting several others. Um, and so my interest in the sustainable development goals is really as a governance tool. And I'll leave it at that for now. So I think you can uh, hear from their own self-introductions that we have a wide range of very interesting perspectives on the issues that we're gonna be talking about tonight. And so I can tell you all, I'm certainly looking forward to hearing what the panelists have to say. So let's kick it off with some questions. Someone's gotta be first. Um, so I, whomever feels like they're best qualified to answer this, um, pardon? Oh, my name is Charlotte DeMont. I'm actually a research scientist in the Department of Atmospheric Science, so I know Jesse. Um, but my question is, since this is a forum on ocean sustainability, um, maybe someone could talk to what are some of the, the top issues in sustainability and the top challenges we're facing today. Give a crack, I'll take a crack at it. So there's lots of different ways to make long lists of all the sustainability challenges with the ocean, but I like to generally talk about three different things. Um, one is climate change, and the main effects of climate change on the ocean are warming temperatures and ocean acidification. Um, lots of nuances within there, but those are kind of the, the big two. The second would be pollution, and pollution comes in many different forms. Um, in recent years, we've heard a lot about plastic pollution and microplastics, how plastics break down and are found in animal tissues you know, all throughout the world, especially marine mammals accumulate plastics and other fish, um, other types of marine life. So we have climate change, pollution, and then the third would be over-harvesting or over-fishing. Um, and specifically within fishing, um, I focused in my recent career on IUU fishing, which is illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing. So I generally divide the sustainability challenges into those three Categories, climate change, pollution, and overfishing. So I would add one more that people aren't speaking about, and for my students in the audience, Mr. Hall, you've already heard this. So it deals with the idea of fishing. Because of our human population growing and humans being what we are, we like to have what we want wherever we are. The issue that we are not addressing is how much we are removing from the ocean and not returning to the ocean. All the fish that we take out, we bring inland, those nutrients wind up in landfills on land. Those nutrients used to decay in the ocean environment, sink, and be resources for life in the ocean. It's an issue we are not addressing, but it is a major issue because those nutrients are being removed and not being replaced. So that is also a major issue when we talk about sustainability that's going to have to be addressed because we are changing the fundamental ecology of the ocean environment by removing nutrients and not replacing them. Just to add one more to that, I think about sustainability through a social lens, and so I just think it's important to point out that 3 billion people depend on the ocean for their major source of protein. And so we need to think about sustainability issues as it relates to human needs and well-being and interests. 
Sorry, I'm going to interrupt and, and comment. Um, so just kind of building off of what these two had said, um, the animal food web, and this is again from the scope of the Arctic, but I'm, I'm pretty sure it's happening globally. Um, the food web is changing. Animals, because of climate change, are migrating to different locations and they're being affected by ocean acidification. So crustaceans, their shells are being eaten away by the highly acidic ocean compared to what it normally is. And so we have this whole shift in the ecosystem. So that affects things like fishing, it affects the animals. It's really a bigger problem and it's happening pretty widespread. Hi, Rick Bloss. I'm a AP environmental science teacher at Fort Collins High School. And climate change is something we discuss throughout the entire year in my class. And um, out of all the changes that are taking place in the oceans because of climate change, is there any one single part of it that we need to be more worried about or it's going to happen faster? Is it ocean acidification? Is it changes in the thermohaline patterns? Is it sea level rise? Which one is really going to affect us the fastest if we don't get it under control? Sorry about that. So one of the major issues that is coming up is as the environment changes temperature, people don't realize that there is a relationship between the temperature of the environment and the type of nutrients found in the fish and the plankton. We're actually seeing a shift in the lipid composition of the organism in the ocean environment. And unfortunately, that change in lipid is going to affect how animals adapt. Because certain animals need certain types of nutrients and it's not going to be available in their diet. So there's actually a shift away from polyunsaturated fatty acids, which are considered the healthier type of lipids, to more saturated. This won't only affect the animals, it's also going to affect human health because that's going to shift people to more heart disease potential with a higher saturated fat diet because we're losing the polyunsaturated fats in the foods. Um, so it's pretty difficult, I think, to say which is the most dire problem we have because everything's kind of happening, happening slowly and simultaneously. Um, from my experiences in rural Alaska, so I've done a lot of work not only on icebreakers but also in villages in Alaska where there's a lot of Inupiat or Inuit populations and it's really interesting speaking to those communities because they're seeing the effects now from, from issues with climate change in the ocean. So they have these traditions where they whale and they, they get a major source of their food from the oceans and these are very small communities that are very isolated from, from bigger places where they could easily get supplies that they need. So they are really being affected now, not just by sea level rise, but because of the changing sea ice conditions. It's changing the, the way in which they hunt and that they live their daily lives. So I, I wouldn't say that's the most important globally, but it's definitely an issue that's happening right now to people, um, not just in Alaska, I'm sure, but also villages probably on coastlines in Siberia and other more remote locations. Yeah, I always, uh, whenever I hear a question about what is the most um, important issue, it, it kind of just depends for whom, you know, who, for whom. For, for coastal communities in Alaska, it might be ocean acidification, which is causing invertebrate shell, invertebrates to be, not be able to form shells. And the fish that eat those invertebrates, populations are collapsing because the prey is going away. And the people depend on those fish for their livelihoods. That's a direct impact. And as Jesse said, they see it with their own eyes. They can pick up shells that are disintegrating in their hands. So. Um, for a coastal community, is it could be um, the, the ocean acidification, or it could be sea level rise that's literally washing their homes away. For those of us in Colorado, it's a, it's not a quite as easy to answer that question to say which is how is we have to determine for each of us how does the ocean impact our lives personally. For some of us, it might not impact our lives at all, honestly. Um, for others, it might be very important, um, but it's a very much an it depends question. Just really quickly, some lovely girl gave me her seat. Isn't that nice? <laughs> um, the, these kids are great. My name is Eleanor Glide. I'm with the United Nations Association of Northern Colorado. 
And I just want to introduce ourselves to you and to the students because we have a United Nations Association chapter on campus. And I have put out on the table over there these wonderful cards that about the sustainable development goals. They're beautiful, pick one up, and also our membership cards. And that's it. Thank you for doing this. Thank you. Hi, my name is uh, Gabby Sinagra. I'm actually a student of Dr. Gruby's. <laughs> so actually, Dr. G, this one goes out to you. Um, so last semester in environmental governance, my group and I, we actually uh, studied the sustainable development goals. And something we found is that while it was like an incredible step in a wonderful new direction, they were pretty vague and pretty broad. And a lot of targets, like over 169, I think it was. And so my question is, since their implementation, do you think they've been successful? Because marine protected areas are quite large and can be you know, pretty difficult to maintain policy and see if anybody's following through. So has it been followed through? And if not, what would you tweak from a policy standpoint? Such a good question. One of our students, good job. Um, not an easy question. Um, I think it's too early to say, right? We're only five years out. The goals are, you know, we're looking at 2030 um, as sort of the target date. Um, and I think, um, you know, definitely one of the critiques is that they are, there are too many of them, right? And they're too vague, too broad. There's 169 targets, there's 17 goals. Compare that to the Millennium Development Goals, there were eight of them, right? And only 21 um, very specific targets. And so that's definitely one of the critiques, right? How, how are we gonna know we're making progress um, on a timeline that, that matters? Um, but I think there's also the other side of that, right? We've had a lot of failures in sort of top down, kind of heavy handed approaches to global environmental governance. Um, and the SDGs takes a different approach. It's not a treaty. It's not a legally binding treaty. These are voluntary, goals that countries sign up for. And so the other argument is that these sort of, the vagueness is um, a strength because it allows different countries to be creative in devising a national implementation mechanism that works for their particular context, right? It's not a one size fits all. Um, I think TBD, we have to wait and see whether it works. I, I hope it does and I, it, I, I see a lot of promise um, I can continue, but let's give the other panelists a chance to weigh in on that. Excellent question, Gabby. I'm gonna use the prerogative of the moderator for a moment and ask a follow-up uh, to that, which is, uh, I think you made a very important point about the SDGs being a voluntary structure. My question is, I, I know a lot more about the climate negotiations than the SDGs, is there a formal mechanism for uh, people to report on their progress towards the voluntary commitments they've made in response to the SDGs? So is there gonna be an easy way for people to look at how, how nations are doing in their pursuit of these? Yeah, that's a great question. Craig might be able to speak to this too. Okay, um, uh, yeah, so that's, that's the oceans meeting. So the 2017 and then the, there's another one in 2020 another UN Ocean meeting, and the point of that meeting is stock taking. So it's an opportunity um, to measure and sort of gauge progress, but I also think one of the most um, influential tools for enforcement is the blame and shame game, um, where there is no sort of legal mechanism with teeth. What we do have is um, an accountability mechanism where we can sort of embarrass one another and say, why aren't you doing more? Or the opposite, right? Give accolades and say, look what, look what you have done. You know, um, others should follow suit. So yeah, that's, that's how I would answer that. Good evening, I'm John Anderson, otherwise known as the Lorax. I might uh, answer that question. What entity in the in the world is not 
better prepared to protect those spaces, both on land and the ocean, than our own military. We have to start thinking different and acting different to save our planet. Anyone want to comment on that comment? It's a controversial one. <laughs> um, and I think, yeah, I think you're right. So there has been, um, in recent years, a trend towards declaration of very, very large scale marine protected areas. I am not going to say that was me. <laughs> um, and um, we've seen we've seen some of those uh, arising around military bases. Um, the Chagos Marine Protected Area is a great example of that. Um, and uh, you know, it's it's both. I think there can be benefits to thinking about protection around existing areas where there's already sort of they're like off limits. Um, but th there's also a lot of controversy about that particular one, um, the Chagos Marine Protected Area, it's a UK overseas territory, where there have been implications for indigenous communities who have been sort of permanently kind of expelled from those spaces. So it's a really complicated um, comment, and I think it's very context specific how it plays out in particular places. So, um, I would just add in general that I agree that the the military, uh, militaries in general, but specifically the U.S. Department of Defense has a very big role, in fact, in environmental security, with they, which they call a term that they use called environmental security. In 2015, I attended a meeting hosted by the DOD in Thailand called the Pacific Environmental Security Forum. And the, it was a massive event, thousands of people, and the entire purpose was um, how is environmental degradation and climate change impacting national security, not just for the United States, but for our, our friends around the world. So there's definitely a, a recognition that um, environmental degradation, specifically ocean sustainability, is important for national security and also international security. And there are many efforts actually already underway to address it. Hi, I'm Karina. I'm a way cooler student of Dr. Groovy's. Um, and I just kind of wanted to expand on what those efforts are. The military efforts? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so the, there's um, a number of different... So the, the, way, the way that the military, in my experience, looks um, thinks about climate change and environmental security is largely around the readiness of troops, um, training, operations, um, transportation, um, as you probably know, with, as polar ice sheets melt, it opens up new passageways for not only transportation, but potentially military you know, movement. Um, there are lots of naval bases all around the world, not just the United States, but other countries that can be directly impacted by raising, rising sea levels. Um, Norfolk, Virginia is one of the biggest, I think the biggest in the United States and one of the most um, immediately threatened by climate change and rising sea levels. So. The military is really looking into, will we have to move our naval bases because of climate change? Will we have to reduce the number of training days for our troops because of extreme weather events? Um, so it's really an important issue. And we have lots of um, a huge military presence in the Pacific um, for historical reasons, but also because, um, and so with you know climate change and rising sea levels, those military bases are also a threat. So it's very much a um, looking at military readiness and national security um, as opposed to you know broader issues but um, that's those are the ones that I have experience with and it actually does relate to broader issues because you have to realize that the military has some of the deepest databases of a long-term historical recordings for example of acoustics topography the changes and everything in the ocean because they have been the most active in the ocean and all that information has been made public. So they are very active already. They are also an issue. There are problems with it. But they have also been long-term active and also trying to sustain it in environments as well. Kind of going along those lines, too, um, the US Coast Guard is really heavily involved in ocean research. So the, there's an icebreaker called the Healy that I've been on, and it's run by and operated by the Coast Guard, but it's outfitted for science. And so 
this icebreaker is deployed every year, and it's mostly focused, I think, on Arctic, at least over the last uh, maybe five, 10 years. But um, the, the Coast Guard is heavily involved with helping scientists get the measurements they need to be able to understand long-term changes in the Arctic um, and oceans that they actually sail through. So the Coast Guard has been heavily involved, and, and I've been on the, that icebreaker a few times now, and the Coast Guard is incredibly helpful, and they're very curious about the science, and they're very concerned about climate change. So it's really nice to see that. Just to continue with that thought, the Air Force is, it takes everybody down to the Antarctic and McMurdo Station, former Navy base, that has been adjusted and changed into science and transferred from the Navy to the National Science Foundation. So again, there's been a long-term effort of the military in a lot of these issues. Hello, so my name is Shay McEnroe. I'm an HDNR student here at CSU. And as I continue to learn about these problems, I just keep wondering what I can do. And I am vegetarian, but I was just wondering if you guys feel like consuming less seafood, less fish is one of the best solutions to this problem and if it is effective, because I feel like we vote with our dollar. And if we can do that in any way, I'd like to know you guys' opinion about that. I think eating less seafood is a good option, but also um, uh, selecting sustainable seafood is also a good option as well. Promoting sustainable businesses in general um, is a very good idea. And I, I, I eat seafood, but I always make sure that it's sustainable. In fact, when I was a graduate student in New York City in the early 2000s, I would carry a seafood card in my wallet, and they were paper seafood, Monterey Bay Aquarium seafood watch. And I'd always ask in the restaurants, where's the salmon come from? Where's the They would never know. In the early 2000s, they never knew. And they would sometimes I'd get kind of rude responses from the wait staff, you know, like, what? Salmon? Who cares? And they never knew. Now, nowadays, restaurants print it on their menus, you know, if the seafood is sustainable. And Jack's here, Jack's Seafood here in town, they have a partnership with the Monterey Bay Aquarium to make sure that their seafood is sustainable. So I would say that's one way to vote with your wallet for sure. Great question from another HDNR student. Um, I will say that also there's a, an organization called the In Colorado Inland Ocean Coalition. Um, some of you might be members or you're familiar with them. Um, and so there are ways to engage with ocean activism and uh, ocean conservation through that organization. Um, and one of them is political activism. So pressuring your politicians to pressure their colleagues <laughs> um, on ocean issues that matter for all of us in this country in another way. So I'm a little bit extreme on this one. I don't think you have to live near the ocean. There's a lot we can do in our everyday lives. And it's about the younger generation is going to have a lot of pressure, unfortunately, on you because our generation has done a very bad job. And what I mean by that is your choices. How many people in this room have a cell phone? Please raise your hand. How many people also have a laptop? How many people also have a tablet? Do you realize where the minerals come from so that you can do that? Do you realize that we don't recycle those? There are issues. There are other things we can start doing. Why does Home Depot sell anything that is not energy conserving? We are, can do a lot of things. Why are electric cars the most expensive car on the market? They should be the most affordable because they will help the environment the most. There's a lot we have to do with the way we spend our dollars and ask the commercial industry on what they're putting forward. So there's a lot more we can do. It's not going to be easy, but there's a lot. Look, we created an entire industry, a cell phone industry, on something that we did not need. We all, the older folks in this room, all survived as children, made it to adulthood, some of them even raised children and didn't have constant connection to them. But through advertising, through the social consciousness, it is now a right that every person has a cell phone. Imagine if we change that to teach people about environmental issues, how powerful that will be and the change that we can bring about.
Okay, my, my real question, um, Rich Kamrish, deals with um, two issues. One is that one is going, or well, actually both of them are going on right now. And this is part of the thing is we don't have the time to wait. We really have to think about how we're going to get serious about this problem. One is that between the, um, the jet stream and the um, Gulf Stream that flows in the Atlantic, they are... They are both picked up speed this winter, and they're dumping terrible storms throughout Europe, inland all the way to Germany, um, that are unusual, to say the least. Uh, very high speed winds, and this uh, falls into the atmospheric thing, etc. Then we also have another c case going on um, in the in the North Pacific, um, pretty for almost close to Alaska but it deals with what they call the blob. It's a sudden heating of a large area of ocean that is uh, affecting the wildlife um, in many different ways. If anybody would like or to comment on one or both, I would appreciate it. Um, so I will sort of comment on that. Um, I don't know much about the blob, um, I've, I've heard of the movie The Blob, um, but um, so the jet stream and is highly affected by just patterns in temperature all over the globe, and so irregularities in that stem from irregularities in localized atmospheric dynamics, for example, which is connected to ocean circulation as well. Um, but the Arctic, I know I keep talking about the Arctic, but I'm biased. Um, it has a large impact on the jet stream and kind of how wavering it is. And so the fact that the Arctic is changing so much and it's actually warming at least twice as fast as the rest of the world, it's really affecting how wavy that jet stream is and causing these extreme events. So um, not just the, the issues that you had mentioned, but I don't know if you guys remember last year, um, the Midwest experienced actual Arctic temperatures. And that was because the jet stream dipped down and they were experiencing polar weather essentially. Um, so it's, it's part of a bigger problem of just climate change and the earth warming. Um, addressing that problem is a very challenging issue. Um, a lot of people think it's too late and we're, instead of mitigating climate change, we're kind of adapting to it. We have to kind of shift our mindset into adapting because what we've done is already going to continue. Even if we completely stop emitting greenhouse gases in the atmosphere right now, this stuff's going to live up there for years and years and years. And so we kind of have to think about how we might be able to shift to this new climate. Um, anybody want to come on the blob there? I don't know if you want to comment on that or the blob. Again, I don't know about the blob. Um, but again, the other issues that we run into many different issues as humans with this situation. Because one of the things that affects climate, if you look at any city throughout the United States, as that city expands, humidity changes, increases, because we put down more concrete. That changes the local environment. You now change where water flows and water used to be absorbed all over. These are real issues. But we have human populations growing. We have cities growing. At some point, we're going to have to have these discussions of, are we going to limit human growth and just grow taller in cities, or do we keep expanding? So there are practices that we do that is directly affecting these issues. But I happen to like pavement. So I live where there's pavement because it makes getting around easier. But these are actually real issues. You are now insulating the earth. It doesn't breathe like it used to. These are all changes. When we create a new housing community, first thing we do is take down all the trees. Trees happen to take up CO2. We don't replant those trees. This is a biomass <laughs> issue. So we can do things better, but we're not having the conversation. And we really have to speak about environmental and sustainable construction. And we can do these things better. Uh, 
Hi, my name is Tegan Jansen. I'm a student of Mr. Bloss's at Fort Collins High School. Um, so I know a lot of different countries around the world all have different approaches to addressing the catch-all climate change issue, whether it be doing nothing or having a formal agreement nationwide. My question is, do any of you have a favorite one or one you'd like to see more of the world join in on? I don't have a favorite one, so I think we have to be addressing all, all components of the problem. Other panelists? Yeah, so um, I'm going to get governancy on you. Um, and what, what I think holds the most promise for addressing climate change issues is a concept called polycentric governance. And really what that means is many poly, many centers of governance, decision making, many centers of action, many centers of rulemaking. And so do I think we're going to be saved by the UNFCCC? No. Just national level action, no. State level action, no. Local level action, no. But all of those working together, maybe we have a chance. And what excites me about that type of governance is that if one state fails, another state is experimenting with another approach and they can learn from each other. Same goes at local level. So we, Fort Collins is an, like really one of, one of the best examples globally of what a city can do to address climate change. And so we're privileged to live in this place. But the point is, um, it's about many experiments happening at many different scales of social action um, where we can learn from one another um, and reduce risks of failure because we're all experimenting. So I don't have a favorite, but I have a favorite approach and a way of thinking about climate change. What an what insightful question. Yeah, it's a good point. And, and kind of the whole analogous thing to that is strength in numbers. So, you know, you might think, oh, I recycle, I compost, I ride my bike. It's not going to make a big difference. But if everyone were to do a little bit to reduce their carbon footprint, it could make a larger impact. And so it's something simple that you can do and hopefully people catch on and then we can have a more collective effort of making it a bigger issue um, or a bigger solution. And so we're kind of getting on the tangent of climate change, but it is related because climate change affects the oceans. And you know we've been talking about carbon dioxide, but that affects the oceans because you have a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere it's going to be taken up by the oceans, and that's what's that's what's basically sparking ocean acidification. So, um, little things that you can do, do them, and 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 kind of talk to your friends and family, and convince them that hey, this is something easy that we can do to try to play our part. Hi, my name is Maggie Means. I'm an environmental economics student at CSU, and going back to putting things into the ocean. Um, in terms of doing that, is anyone in the world working on that currently? And if so, what are they doing to accomplish that? Like, what are their strategies? To my knowledge, that is not being done because it's not actually being spoken about yet. So, and it's because I think people are a little bit more caught up with the idea that we all put in nutrients by eutrophication into the ocean but near shore areas. That's not right now going to be in the deep ocean. At some point in time, in about a thousand years, it will make it to the deep ocean. But to my knowledge, no. So it's about, again, an education process, really looking at what we're doing and the practices that we have. Because it's not a simple solution. Taking a ship of dead fish carcasses out to the ocean and dumping them is not going to look very good. And where that may be carried by currents and where that potentially could wash up could be a problem. So it's going to be a complicated solution to solve, but it is something that we're going to have to start thinking about. Hi, everyone. My name is Dawson Metcalf. I'm the coordinator for the master's degree in conservation leadership at CSU. So if any of you are looking at that for a master's degree at CSU, come talk to me. Um, uh, my question is kind of tying to this concept, right? CO2 emissions, ocean, governance. 
Paris Agreement and this action in our current administration looking at pulling us out, talking about the shame game, right? What implications are we seeing with that if the United States is pulling out of the Paris Agreement? I don't know if any of you would like to expand or maybe even touch on that. Well, you guys are really probing the limits of our knowledge up here. So no, great question, Dawson. Um, I, you know, I think the effects of that remain to be seen. Um, but what I find hope in and um, opportunity in is that other um, sort of economic leaders, <laughs> China, India, might step up to fill the void. Okay, so we see the U.S., a global sort of leader, pulling out of the, the global climate agreement. Let's see some of these other nations step up and fill that void. That's sort of what I hope to see happen. What will happen, I don't know. Hi, my name is Diana Wall. I'm the director of the School of Global Environmental Sustainability. Glad you guys are here. We love doing these for you all. Well, I have a question that it has to do with biodiversity since we know so much and we love so much about seeing whales on even commercials on TV or insurance companies or, you know, just thinking about uh, leopard seals and all the biodiversity in the ocean. Could you comment something on what is seen for the future on biodiversity and how they, these large animals, may adapt to this warming acidified ocean. Thank you, oh great one. <laughs> so when we're looking at conservation, when we're looking at preservation of biodiversity, nature needs the ability to freely move where it has to move to meet new changes. That's running into direct conflict with human populations. Animals cannot freely move. So in the Antarctic, looking at the leopard seals, I am working with leopard seals that are on an ice-based seal. That's where they were only found was on ice cliffs. The group I am working with has now colonized land. They are now taking over land. We are now seeing Weddell seals, which were a fast ice-based seal now colonizing land. So they're bringing and coming into new environments they have not been in for probably thousands of years. But with the Antarctic, there's not human population there to prevent these animals from reestablishing themselves in a new environment. When you get to the established parts of the world with human population, that's going to be conflict. And that's where I think we're going to have issues. You're seeing animals move. Here in Colorado, you're watching bears adapt to the changing issue. They're finding new food resources. The problem is it's right in the middle of human population where they're finding these new food resources. You have a human-animal clash. That usually doesn't work for the animal. So again, are we going to change our policies to allow and sacrifice some land to allow organisms to adapt. Some countries are. We are seeing that, for example, in Costa Rica with sea turtles. They have made adjustments to the beaches so that those sea turtles can hatch and they will protect them. So are we going to do more of that? And I think that's the question for the future. How much are we going to allow nature to adapt and then we adapt to allow it to reestablish itself. Just a quick follow-up. I think I think it's a great question, and I I think it's also really important to recognize that the major tool, the major policy tool right now to conserve marine biodiversity is marine protected areas. They're parks in the ocean, and guess what? They don't move, <laughs> right? They are lines on map that generally stay the same. And so I think we really need to be thinking creatively and innovatively about new policy and governance tools for conserving marine biodiversity. So what we have seen is larger MPAs, right, larger marine protected areas that can conserve a greater portion of an animal's range. And so that's promising. 
Um, there hasn't been a lot of research to show their ecological effectiveness, but I also think we need to be thinking about more dynamic policy tools that can respond more quickly and maybe in three dimensions to the changing needs of our ocean. So I spent about 10 years studying coral reefs, and if you read about the state of coral reefs right now, it can be pretty depressing. Um, but at the same time, while coral reefs are dying all over the world, uh, in fact, entire ecosystems of coral reefs, not just species, but entire ecosystems are dying, I always think back to um, times that I've been snorkeling in Florida Bay, um, off the coast of Miami, and seen corals living literally in raw sewage. I know that coral reefs live in the Persian Gulf, which has some of the highest temperature fluctuations in the world, and natural oil that leaks out of the sand and the ground. So there are incredibly rugged species at the same time as fragile species. And I think that ecosystems and biodiversity of the future are just going to look different. They're not going to be, I mean, we'll, we will always have biodiversity, um, but it's just going to look a lot different. And I still have hope. I've seen coral reefs in Indonesia that were completely destroyed by dynamite fishing come back within a few years. So. Uh, to quote Jurassic Park, life finds a way. <laughs> Hi, my name is Wally Jacobson, and I'm so thankful for the opportunity that you're providing to us to, uh, this evening to address some of these very critical issues. One that I don't hear much about, um, but I think it's out there, and it directs, directly relates to the ocean in terms of oxygen uh, that we breathe. Um, you know, there, there is a lot of publicity around the loss of rainforests and other forests that provide oxygen, obviously, worldwide. But I've also heard about the issue of uh, plankton in the oceans, and phytoplankton, I believe, is, is another related issue, uh, more microscopic type of animals. And they provide a lot of our oxygen, too, from what I understand. So isn't, the, isn't this something that's a pretty big deal? We just don't seem to be hearing much about it. And what if the temperatures continue as they are increasing and acidification likewise? in terms of those uh, tiny creatures in the ocean that we don't hear much about. What is your level of concern? And, and do you feel like there's anything that can be done to help alleviate this? Thank you. OK, so the we receive about 60% of our atmospheric oxygen from primary production in the ocean. So it provides the bulk of the oxygen in our atmosphere. The fortunate slash question is we don't know enough about the microscopic world in the ocean to know what's going to be happening. A lot of it is actually too small for us to measure. We are now gaining techniques just to look at the DNA to get an idea of how many different species are out there. So we don't know what's going to happen. The beneficial side of it is they are microscopic organisms, which means they have very short life histories, which means they're going to turn over their DNA quite frequently and probably have the ability to adapt much faster than much more long-term or long-lived organisms. So they may be able to adapt to some of these changes much faster than other types of organisms. Hi, my name is Nathan Smith. Um, I'm in the CLTL program, so Conservation Leadership Master's Program. And we work a lot and talk a lot about how marginalized communities can be engaged in conservation. So I'd be interested to know or hear about experiences that you have with indigenous communities in conservation, whether that's governance or MPA uh, management or anything in that sphere. Great question, and I think it relates directly to the use of targets as a global governance tool. And so I'll use, I've spent a lot of time um, studying the large-scale marine protected area movement, so I'll use that as an example. Um, we see sort of both sides of it. <laughs> um, targets have had a major effect on marine conservation globally. So. I'm talking specifically about the Convention on Biological Diversity, sort of 10% protected areas in the ocean, okay? So that has really played a very high mobilizing effort among national level govern governments, um, philanthropic organizations, donor organizations to sort of meet those global targets. 
And what we've seen in the last, basically since 2006 with the establishment of Papahana Makuakea in Hawaii is this proliferation of enormous, enormous marine protected areas. It's hard for you to even imagine how big these are. There are um, sizes of Texas, for example, in the ocean, okay? And so some of the leaders of that movement have been small island developing states, particularly in the Pacific Ocean. And so, for example, Palau, a country of 20,000 people, has declared one of the largest marine protected areas in the world. And it has support from its indigenous leaders. In fact, the Council of Chiefs in Palau used their traditional conservation mechanism called the bull to protect this ocean space. Um, so there's the positive. But on the other hand, we also see um, nations with overseas territories um, in an effort to meet those global uh, targets declaring large-scale marine protected areas, particularly and increasingly in their overseas territories. So in 2009, George Bush didn't declare a huge MPA the size of Texas off the coast of California. In fact, he did it in the Mariana Islands, the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands. And there has been sort of a, a hugely controversial uh, effort, um, and in particular concerns about impacts to indigenous uses of that space and connections to that space. So we see it in both sides. And so there are some scholars who are very concerned about how targets might motivate behavior to conserve quickly in ways that are not just. So it's a complicated issue and a, a really good question. Uh, on the opposite end, on small marine protected areas, I've, I've um, seen Lots of cases throughout the Philippines when I was doing field work in, um, years ago of coastal communities that had what they called sanctuaries. And the same way that in Fort Collins we have green space, you know, coastal communities in the Philippines would have their marine sanctuary, which was usually not very big at all, kind of the opposite of what Rebecca was just talking about. A very small area. In fact, it, it, how effective it is was also kind of questionable because it was so small. Um, and there was also issues with you know, poaching and corruption and whatnot, but still, it was a source of pride that each community had an area that they called the sanctuary. Um, and I just, it, I just thought of it right now, like, well, we have parks in our town, we have green spaces, and coastal communities in some countries have their marine sanctuaries. And a lot of these marine sanctuaries go back many, many, many generations um, out of an understanding that it's necessary to close certain areas of fishing for certain periods of time to allow fish to rejuvenate, populations to rejuvenate. So it's something that people have known for many, many years and generations. Um, but I think in the Pacific, they call them taboo areas, where there are different um, customs around closing small areas for fishing. So it happens on both scales, large and small. OK, I saw a lot of hands up at the front. I have three people lined up back here. And then I'll come up to the front and call on all you guys in just a moment. Hi, Bella Brandis here. I'm studying chemical and biological engineering at CSU, and I'm minoring in global environmental sustainability. Um, my question is in regards to overfishing, although I suppose it could be generalized. Um, how do we engage the global population in sustainable fishing practices, and do you think panels such as the IPCC plays an important role in this? I think how you spend your commercial dollars will play the bigger role in this. I think us making certain decisions, does every McDonald's have to have a fish sandwich? I'm not kidding, because that's pollock. It's being overfished. Why is it being overfished? Because people in places that don't have pollock want their fish sandwich. So there's going to be, there has to be discussions, how we spend our money, where we're spending our money, I think is going to be the bigger influence in time as to how some of these decisions will be made. Because it's not, it's not easy. Overfishing, there are people whose livelihoods depend on that industry. So just changing the industry and saying, stop doing what you're doing, but what do those people do for their jobs? Some of those people, that's been their livelihood throughout the family's tradition. So it's complicated. It's not as easy as, well, what you're doing is not good, so go do something else. That has never worked in our attempts to change policy. So I think we have to be creative and learn how can we do it better? 
how can we keep people employed and how can we meter that so I, that's why it's so complicated to work out some of these issues Yeah, I think it's a great question, and I'll use an example from the Pacific, again, uh, of where we see some success. So the parties to the Nauru Agreement are eight Pacific Island countries, their nations, that have banded together to produce a collective bargaining agreement. So these countries used to individually lease their fishing rights to foreign fishing nations. None of them are really um, have a domestic fishing um, industry, so they've leased them. And they didn't have a lot of bargaining power individually, right? So collectively, they've set these prices. And so they were able to charge more for the, for the price to fish in their waters and at the same time reduce the total allowable catch. And so they're making more money and they're fishing less. And so to me, like, I agree, you know, the individual actions, they're important and we should do them. But, you know, like refusing a straw isn't going to save the oceans. It's the big policy tools, the big levers, to me, that are going to save us. And that's a great example of one of them. Another example, I don't know too much how the um, IPCC would influence international fisheries, but when I worked for the federal government and I was going to meet with another country, the first thing I was told to tell them was, please sign the Port State Measures Agreement, PSMA. So if you want to look at an international treaty, that's um, related to fishing, Port State Measures Agreement is one of the most important ones. And the main idea behind the Port State Measures Agreement is that countries would agree to upgrade their ports where they import seafood to better detect illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing. Basically, if you cut off the supply of illegal products, that's the, the strategy that would be have downstream impacts on ecosystems. So look up Port State Measures Agreement. Hello, my name is Jamie. I'm a member of the Global Social and Sustainable Enterprise MBA here at CSU. I'm here with my venture team and we're currently looking at kelp growth as a tool to mitigate climate change. Um, we're looking at the sale of carbon credits to larger companies. However, we've come across an issue of ethical standards. We're worried, and this is kind of a selfish question, but is it ethical to sell carbon credits to these large companies? Is that kind of a pass for them to create more carbon and to kind of offset the efforts that we're putting in? I'd just love to hear your opinion on that. I am not educated enough on the subject to really pass a valuable comment on that. So sorry about that. That's not something I feel confident enough to speak to with any security. I think you've stumped the panel. <laughs> Hi, my name is Sam. Um, I was wondering, since corporations are responsible for a greater amount of harm to the marine ecosystem than we as individuals are, uh, kind of number one, why are they not held to a higher level of accountability? And number two, um, how would any ramifications be put into place against them for large disasters, kind of based off of the deep water horizon oil spill? Well, I wasn't going to talk about deep water horizon, but <laughs> I can tell you that the blame and shame game works great with big corporations because they will do anything to protect their brand. Um, when I was in working in Bangkok for the U.S. Agency for International Development, Costco got in trouble for importing shrimp that was, so it's kind of a step, a few steps removed, but the fish that were ground up to feed shrimp farms were caught using slave labor. Um, and Costco got in trouble. Even though the shrimp farms were fine themselves, the feed that went into the shrimp farms came from fish that was caught with slave labor. And Costco got in trouble. So Walmart came to us and said, we will do anything to not get in trouble like Costco did. We'll do anything. And so as representatives from the US government said, well, you should really look into the supply chains and figure out where your shrimp or farms are getting their food from. So 
engaging with large corporations is a very good strategy because it can be very difficult to change public opinion. You know, you're not going to convince millions of people to not get their fish sandwich from McDonald's. But if you can convince the CEO of McDonald's, who is one person or a board of directors, you can convince that that smaller group or that one individual to change their buying practices, you can influence you know, millions of people, uh, choices. I was just looking it up on my phone to make sure I got it right. There's this great organization in Fort Collins called Fish Choice. And is anyone here from Fish Choice? Anyone? Okay. Well, that I mean, that's what they do. They, they look at supply chains and they help um, companies think about um, how to ensure sustainability in their supply chains. So check out Fish Choice. They're local um, and they're doing really great work. Thanks. Uh, good evening. My name is Tim Fellows. I'm minoring in uh, Stoges. And I'm not in your section, Dr. Starger, but I'm taking classic yeah. teaching. Um, so this is following on to something you said earlier. If the global coral, eco I mean, uh, the larger ecosystem, as you look at it, if it has to adjust to ocean acidification at a very quick rate, and of course it, you know, it's very immobile, what's that going to do to fisheries as far as kind of a breeding ground and a, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, a breeding ground and uh, kind of a area for the world's fisheries to kind of get started, is that going to crash a lot of fisheries around the world and how's that going to respond? I think it's already happening. Um, so I, it, it's easy to be pessimistic about coral reefs. I try to be optimistic. Um, there are, I think coral reef scientists are still trying to figure out exactly what's going to happen with both warming temperatures and ocean acidification. It's kind of a one-two punch on coral reefs. Corals grow skeletons and they need specific pHs of the water to seawater to grow those skeletons. So as oceans become more acidic, the skeletons either grow more slowly or they don't grow at all or become more brittle. So as coral reefs degrade, um, lots of oceanic or reef associated fish use the coral reefs for their breeding grounds or their nursery grounds. And those populations probably will collapse. And I think it's happening already. So sorry, I don't have a good, happy answer for you, but yes, you're right. Hi, my name is Julian. I'm from Fort Collins High School. And my question is, how do we convince politicians who have landlocked constituencies to actually care about ocean issues? No one's got the magic formula? Come on. I don't have a good answer for you. I'm, I'm thinking about your question. Um, I think you have to link it to other issues that they care about um, and make it relevant in, to their constituents, convince them that their constituents care um, and sort of pressure them in ways that really just link it to issues that they're already working on, show them the linkages there um, and make it local, make a local argument. That's the best I can do. Anyone else have ideas on that? It's a, it's a really good question. I mean, I'll actually add to that. I think Rebecca's making a very important point that politicians, landlocked or coastal, are primarily responsive to their constituents. So if the constituents care, the politicians will care. So the key is convincing your peers and your fellow citizens to let politicians know what they care about. Hi, my name is David. I am an ESS major at CSU. And my question runs more along the line of plastics in our oceans and how they've made their way all the way down to the bottom of our food chain and zooplankton. How should we, should we approach this issue and just beefing up, continuing to beef up our recycling industry and investing in that or looking towards the corporations and why they keep producing more and more plastic? We have to make better plastics. We have to make plastics that are plant-based that actually biodegrade. There are already, for example, if you look up, uh, forgot, I think it's Salt Brewing Company in Florida. They created an edible biodegradable six-pack ring holder to hold the beer. Why has that not been picked up by every soda? So we can do better. That's, it's already out there. 
is the idea of making some plastics from squid proteins so that we biodegrade it. Those are the things that we have to do. Plastic allows our lives to be affordable. It allows you to have fo affordable medical care. If we still had to clean glass for everything in medicine, you couldn't afford medical care. So plastics still play a value. We just have to make them better. We have to make them so they don't harm the environment to the degree that they do. And the technology and the expertise is out there that we can do this. It's going to cost a little bit more in the beginning. So the question again comes down to, will you be willing to pay a little bit more for certain things in order to get that better aspect for the environment? Your question made me think of an answer to your question because I've been stewing on this. It's really an important question and they're linked. So plastics, right? They're in all of our seafood now. That's a way that ocean issues are relevant for us here in Colorado, a really clear one, right? And so you advocate on issues that matter locally. And another great example is the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico, right? It originates from nutrient pollution way, way upstream, right? In the Mississippi River um, watershed. What do they care about the dead zone? It's hard to convince them that it matters, right? But what matters to them is the fertilizer pollution in their own water. And it matters because it affects human health. And it's also a waste of money to dump a lot of extra fertilizer on your agricultural lands that don't, they're not necessary. So those are, that's just a more nuanced and specific way of answering, make it matter locally. Maybe don't talk about ocean conservation, talk about human health and local waterway health, even though it has a downstream impact on the oceans. So thanks again for making me think about that. Hi, my name is Travis, and I am also an ESS major at CSU with a uh, sustainable energy minor from SOGIS. My question uh, sort of relates to David's as far as ocean pollution, but I'm just curious from the UN perspective and the sustainable development goals, are there policies in place that are forcing countries to limit the amount of pollution they create? Or, you know, when I think of the problem of, of sustainability in our oceans, the aspect of pollution I, I just can't get past. So I'm wondering, you know, is that a, a primary issue that's being addressed or is it sort of being left up to individual country to address at this point? I, I, I know there are international treaties around things like ocean dumping because those affect, you know, if, you, if, if our country dumped something in the middle Pacific Ocean, it would affect the entire ring. So there are international treaties at the UN level around ocean pollution. I don't know the names of them off the top of my head. Um, but yeah, we were just thinking, that I think there are targets Yeah, I think there is a target around. in the SDGs around plastics and reducing pollution. So it's there. And then it's, as any other target, it's up to <laughs> the national level. So no one's forcing anyone to do anything through the SDGs. Remember, it's voluntary. But I will say it has mobilized a lot of attention from NGOs like Oceana is really paying attention to, to plastics. A lot of philanthropic organizations are turning to plastics. So it's mobilized more attention in civil society. So yes, people are paying attention to it and trying to do something about it. I've got a couple people lined up on the side here and a couple more in the middle, but we're working our way through the queue here. Hi, I'm Corinne from Fort Collins High School. And I was wondering, how are global warming and ocean acidification affecting natural processes like upwelling? And how will those affect future generations? So global climate change instead of global warming number one, because there are actually some places getting colder in the world. So it's actually climate change. And upwelling, so there's different things that affect upwelling. You're always going to have upwelling whenever you have currents hitting land. That's going to actually force the water up and still bring those nutrients up. So the real issues with change is actually in the power and the movement of the currents themselves. As was stated earlier by the gentleman, we're actually seeing some of the currents of the Gulf Stream speeding up. And what that's doing is actually bringing more, more, more warm water up. And that's going to affect the ocean conveyor belt because all the currents in the ocean are connected. 
So we need water in the northern and southern hemisphere to reach the polar regions to get cool enough and then sink in order to continue the circulation. And we're starting to see changes in that process. And we don't know what those changes are going to cause because it's still too new, but it is an issue that we're going to have to start being aware of. Because as more warm water is brought up to the north, that's going to melt more sea ice. So it's very important for everybody to understand the melting of the polar ice cap in the north will not change sea level. That's ice floating in your cup. When the ice melts, your cup does not overflow. It's ice on land, glaciers, Antarctica. When that melts, that is increasing sea level. But the changes to the polar ice cap, that controls climate. It reflects the sunlight back into the atmosphere so it's not being absorbed by the ocean. So the less ice, more heat into the ocean, the more it's going to change things. So those are the issues that we really have no understanding of. But here's an alternative. The loss of the polar ice cap is going to shorten the distance ships have to travel in order to deliver goods. They're going to have less carbon emissions. So there's going to be people who's going to argue both sides. That's why, again, in the future, some of this can get complicated. So I'm going to argue with that. Um, so yes, you will have a shorter path because the Northwest Passage Passage will be open, but you're also going to open up the opportunity for more entities who want to send ships through that location. So are you actually reducing carbon? Depends on how many people have ships right now and if they can meet the demand fast enough to move ships across. So again, I'm not, it's not, that's, those are going to be arguments made by people. I'm actually not supporting the idea that the loss of ice is good. But realize you're going to start hearing that and they're going to start using it as a basis of, oh, look, my ship doesn't have to travel as far. So this is actually environmentally better for us. I'm not saying it's better. But you're going to start to hear many different arguments as these changes are occurring. That's why I think the most important thing for all the young folks out here is to get educated about all the different nuances so that when these become issues, you can really start speaking to them and using your votes intelligently to help bring about change. One more um, example that I just thought of from the Pacific, there, the upwelling in the Eastern Pacific is responsible for bringing nutrients up and supporting some of the most productive fisheries in the world. And as climate change continues to um, change global weather patterns and ocean circulation patterns, those upwelling patterns are also becoming less predictable and more irregular. And that's directly affecting fisheries in the Pacific. Yeah, a similar case. Um, so if you have changes in ocean currents, even just a little bit, or temperatures that affect the ocean currents, you can change not just upwelling coastally, but you can have a lot more mixing in the oceans, especially in shallow regions. This is really important um, because you can mix material from the bottom of the ocean to the top of the ocean. And so um, a good example of this is I recently published a paper looking at this really interesting case in the Bering Sea where it's only about 50 meters deep of water, but we had really warm temperatures that cause the ocean to mix up much more quickly than it normally does. And that actually caused a huge phytoplankton bloom in the Bering Strait. And that actually affected the aerosols in the atmosphere that could affect Arctic clouds. So there's all these little changes that can happen that have these sequential effects um, just from changing the current a little tiny bit. So that, that's a, that was a good question. It may not completely polarize them to the opposite direction, but even if you change your speed, or slightly the direction, it can really affect the ecosystems and then um, um, feedback effects down the line. Hello, I'm Casey Shaw, uh, studying biological sciences at Colorado State University. So this one I got reminded of earlier when we were discussing like corals, like how some of them are collapsing and some of them are able to thrive in the sewage infested or extremely hot environments. So considering that these corals exist in some areas of the world, but limited ones, and then other ones are changing rapidly and their existing species that are delicate are dying out. Given how dire the state of corals is and how important they are to the ecology, is there merit to the idea if 
if not necessarily just directly transplanting species that are capable of handling the changing local conditions, modifying species that are like replacing their symbionts to be more tolerant of heat changes or whatever, and then trying to engineer the ecosystems to survive these changes, or is that considered feasibly on a large scale? Short answer, yes, and it's already being done. Um, not on any scale that is, is currently making a difference on, on an ecosystem-wide scale, but coral scientists are looking into those very issues um, with breeding, um, breeding corals, raising them under different temperature and acidification conditions. Um, so that type of research is currently being done, for sure. Look up the, the term super corals and you'll find a little bit more information about that. Hi there guys, I'm back here. Um, my name is Jordan Gorostiza. I am a master's student in the Department of Journalism and Media Communication um, at Colorado State, and I study really neither of them. <laughs> um, right now I'm, I'm studying conservation marketing, um, which has to do with uh, planning and implementing um, interventions to try to change behaviors in a, to, um, to a more sustainable way. Um, and I'm wondering, I know a lot of times with climate change and other environmental issues, we try to inform people and educate people a lot, um, but the research is showing that that's not enough. You know, people process information with their own biases and there's lots of things that can interfere with that. It doesn't necessarily change behavior. So I'm wondering if you guys, in your guys' respective fields, you are seeing a trend towards trying to understand communication theories a little bit deeper or sort of how how you guys think about that, communicating to the public um, yourselves. That's a very good point. And a lot of times scientists are terrible communicators. Um, but we, you know, we have, for example, this mosaic study that I've been involved with, we have a whole communications team that's dedicated to really helping scientists relay their information to the public, to schools, to, to all, different types of audiences. And so it's it's super important to be able to communicate what we're doing and not use jargon and, and make it digestible to the public and make people care about it. So that's a really good point. And I think, I mean, some scientists are naturally really good, really good at it, some are terrible. So it's, it's nice to have people like you help us to communicate what we're trying to say. I'll just add that um, in our department, um, uh, faculty member Josh Zafros, who's a journalist here in Fort Collins, and he's developed a um, new certificate program in environmental communication. So yeah, that's something we're definitely thinking about. We, uh, some of my colleagues focus specifically on behavior change and how communication affects that. So that's not my particular expertise, but certainly there are people focused on it. I will say one of the most um, sort of successful campaigns that I saw in Palau where I've done a lot of work on marine conservation conservation was um, run through Rare, which is an organization that really focuses on social marketing. And they ran this campaign, the turtle is your friend. They got kids to tell their parents, we don't eat sea turtle anymore. The turtle is our friend. And there's enormous success from that marketing campaign. So we are seeing sort of applications of social marketing in marine conservation um, around the world. So great question and glad you're focusing on that. I'm the pessimist. I'm scared as hell about this. I just attended the World Marine Mammal Conference in December in Barcelona, Spain. Every 25 minutes, 50% of the conference walked outside to smoke cigarettes. These are the researchers discussing these exact issues. Stepping outside to smoke cigarettes that come in packs of tinfoil surrounded by plastic, putting chemicals into the air. And into the so no, I am concerned. Because yes, we have very good communication sometimes with the public, but sometimes the scientists themselves are really, really bad stewards about pushing these ideas forward. Sometimes scientists unfortunately take the part of listen to what I say, but don't do what I do. And I think sometimes our community as scientists has to get better at checking what it is we do and making sure we're setting the right example. So I'm a little bit, I was really surprised. I couldn't believe that many people were doing it, especially at an environmental conference that it was 
that that was still going on. So I was right before December, I was really like, we're doing a great job. Then I went to the conference, I'm like, ooh, no we're not. So we have to get better. So, I, uh, okay, so I have a question for you. Uh, my name is Rich Marincelli, I'm a fish consumer. I'm retired. Um, my question is, there's been a huge growth, as far as I can tell, in the supermarkets. You guys have mentioned Costco and Sam's Club and other places like that. There's now selling farm-raised whatever. Farm-raised salmon, farm-raised shrimp, farm-raised whatever. It seems like the majority of the products they're selling are farm-raised. Is that good or bad for the oceans? And is it good or bad for me? It depends. Um, I think we recently passed the threshold where over 50% of the seafood consumed in the United States is from farm-raised aquaculture. I think we recently passed 50%. Um, the best way to find out is there's something called Best Aquaculture Practices, BAP. It's um, a certification scheme. So um, that's quick answer is that there are good practices and bad practices um, and to look into it and see if the, if the specific farm-raised um, product that you're getting is certified. Yeah, there's usually a seal, like a, a symbol. Yep. And in terms of your health, it depends on what the farm-raised organisms are being fed. That's going to determine how healthy they are. And the knock against farm raising has been that the feed is being commercially caught. So there's still improvement in the practices that are going on, but farm-raised shrimp is a far better alternative than actual wild caught shrimp. Because the way we catch shrimp is to drag a net across the bottom of the ocean, scooping up everything. This would be like throwing a net across the cattle field, dragging it with weights across the field, everything that falls into the net, that's what we catch. That's what, how we catch shrimp. So there's a lot of bycatch. So it's a devastating fishery. Aquaculture. So if we can actually farm raise them properly, where we actually monitor what gets fed to the organisms as well, yes, it can be much better for certain types of fisheries. So um, I'm Charlotte DeMott again from the Department of Atmospheric Science. And I just wanted to follow up on this question that you asked about change in the changes in ocean upwelling. And Jesse talked on this. Um, um, this is sort of another component that we've only skirted around. Understanding uh, changes to the future climate doesn't involve just what you take out of or put into the ocean or the atmosphere. Um, a lot of the changes that we see really have to deal with how do large-scale circulations like weather patterns and ocean currents change in a future climate. And so if this is, since we have a lot of high school students and undergraduates uh, in this room, um, if, if this is something that's of interest to you, or if you have uh, a natural inclination to understanding mechanical systems, signal processing, if you are someone who enjoys your math and physics classes, um, this is sort of another angle that you can uh, apply your talents to really, to, to really help understand the totality of changes that the, the earth and atmosphere system uh, might undergo in a future climate, so. I'll just close with that and maybe have time for one more comment. Hi. I just wanted to say that there have been some really fascinating questions brought up, especially from the high school students. Like, it's really great to see you guys here. Some really impressive questions. Um, my question is pretty lighthearted. Um, you guys have all, like, you're in the field, like, you're doing your research. I just kind of wanted to know maybe, like, what keeps your passion going? Like, what's a fascinating development or observation or anything like that that has really struck you? Like, it was very interesting to learn about, like, the seals and, like, the coral reef skeletons. Like, anything involved in that that just kind of shows, like, y your passion, I guess. Yeah. Life is extremely resilient. It is, when you get out into the wild and you get to see it, it is amazing to watch the interaction. Because these leopard seals have now started to colonize land, the penguins have to change where they leave and come onto the island 
So you just watch how everything interacts. And when nature is allowed to do itself, it fixes it. The issues are nature can't have free range to change because of the implications we're put on. But it's fascinating to see how life continues to adapt and adjust. And to be able to just get to see it, because I'm just, it's only myself, four other people get dropped on an Antarctic island and I'm left there for between three and five weeks. So no other people, and you just get to see this. It is amazing. And you talk about passion, that, that's a dream, just to be able to see that. I can't. I kind of have two things. So one, following that, just the beauty of where we get to go and how unique these places are. And, you know, on the way up to the North Pole, we saw a mama polar bear and her cub, and they were just playing around on the ice, and they were really cute and deadly, but they're really cute. So it just, like, it kind of makes you smile, and you're like, all right, maybe what I'm doing does affect this down the line. Like, I study aerosols and how they affect clouds, but the clouds affect the sea ice. The sea ice is where the polar bears live and where they depend on their food is the ice edge. So that's changing year in and year out. So you kind of see these things and they're tangible, but then you think about, okay, well, it relates to what I do and I'm trying to help understand a process that can maybe affect these things down the line. Um, two, for me, I work in a very interdisciplinary, international in, in, um, environment. So people from all over the world doing different types of, of research. And one of the coolest things I've noticed of being on icebreakers and going to different places to do studies is you're working with people and you may not understand exactly what they do and that's okay, but you kind of see how what you do links up to what they're, what they're studying. So a lot of my recent research has focused on really, you know, I have my part, you have your part, how do they link together? Because if we can understand the processes that are happening and not just our little niche, you can kind of understand a bigger picture problem and try to address it. And so um, that's a really rewarding thing is to be able to say, all right, I am an atmospheric chemist, you're an oceanographer. Oh, look, cool, these measurements make sense together. Like we're totally seeing how there's biology happening in the ocean and it's and we're seeing signatures in these gas measurements and then we're seeing the signature in the aerosol and we're seeing the signature in the clouds. And so it's really, really fascinating to see those linkages um, between your own discipline and other disciplines. Uh, so I started out um, in science because I like dissecting things. Um, then I got to really love animals and being outside and doing field work and studying beautiful coral reefs and scuba diving 120 feet off of atolls in the Caribbean and just amazing places that I can't even begin to describe if you haven't been there. Um, but in more recent years, what I've really kind of keeps me going is understanding the con how dependent people are on healthy ecosystems. And I've met Alaskan fishermen who's entirely the mayor of a small town in Alaska. He said, my town would not exist if it were not for this salmon fishery, for this halibut fishery, for generations. You know, it's going back generations. Um, I've met owners of seafood industry, seafood companies in the Philippines who said, my, I want my grandchildren to own this company. We want to fish forever. They don't want to just take all the fish as quickly as possible. They want sustainability. So just seeing the connection between people and healthy ecosystems, even though I'm not as closely connected as some of them are, that's, that really inspires me. I'll Quickly. keep it quick. I'll keep it quick. Such a, such a beautiful question to end on. Um, so for me, it's this faith in human creativity and ingenuity and this, this, this really strong faith that, that we can solve these problems. We can be creative. We can come up with solutions that no one else had thought of before. Um, and I've seen that in the Pacific Islands. So they are reframing themselves from small island developing states. They're saying, no, we are large ocean nations and we are leading the global effort in marine conservation. Man, that is inspiring. So that and you all, so my students, I, I get so much energy every day from interacting with students and that's what also gives me a lot of hope for the future is your brains. Okay, our allotted time has come to a close. Will you please join me in thanking the panelists? They did a great job.
Let's go ahead and give yourselves a round of applause for asking such a bunch of good questions. And remember the Antarctic lecture coming up on February 25th and keep your eye on our webpage for the next Managing the Planet. Thank you. Good night.